PMA Corporation and uh, UE Systems manufacture very different technology for, for a common industry. But we share some very important business philosophies in terms of quality technology, quality service and support, and quality people. And uh, we're very honored to be invited to this event. Uh, Doug, Marie, and you guys, all the whole crew put together a great show. It's a great location. We used to call it the most miserable part in the place on earth. Being very, very, what's the word I'm looking for? Facetious. But we're very happy to be here around quality people, quality organizations, and uh, get a little bit of opportunity to talk with common reliability to, to the crowd. Now, Doug did introduce this as the after lunch session, which is always very exciting. In fact, I enjoy it. I was talking to some folks at lunch saying that uh, it's a good challenge for me because I look around and I know I'm going to lose three of you no matter what. No matter what, I'm going to lose three of you. Your sugar is going to be low. Something's going to happen. It's a little bit too late last night. But my challenge is this. If I can keep it three or under, then I'm succeeding in my story. Right? I'm succeeding in my effort here. So, so that's our key performance indicator for the day, three or under. So we're going to keep track, and at the end of the session, we'll make sure of that. So one nice thing about this presentation in an effort to keep everybody's head from bobbing up and down is I'm not going to have you do calisthenics or anything. I'm not going to have you stand up and scratch the guys back next to you. But I do have what I would consider a, an interesting subject, which, is, which refers to deep below the earth. So rather than calisthenics, we're going to do a geography lesson. Just a little one. Make sure that you guys know what part of the world we get to talk about today. Anyone been to South Africa? I knew a couple of you guys had. Interesting place. And uh, can't say I've been there, but Mr. David McGuire, who's right next to us at the booth, make sure you go talk to him after this presentation. And, if you're interested in some more of the geography or whatever, that he has something to share, I'm sure of that. But way down at the tip of Africa is South Africa, and we're going to be focusing on areas that you might see on National Geographic a little bit. Okay, Some of those you know, lion hunts and things like that that occur, which is pretty exciting, certainly for my 8-year-old, right? in terms of the quality of the, of, the, of the images and stuff. But we've heard of Cape Town, East London, we've heard of uh, even Johannesburg. Well, the area that I'm going to be talking about today is just north of Johannesburg, south of, uh, in the Kruger National Park, near the Kruger National Park, just west of Pretoria, okay? And, and there's opportunities. We've all, we're, all of us being in the reliability industry, there are opportunities to come across a, a, a situation that really justifies reliability, justifies predictive maintenance. Sometimes it's a very critical application that we identified a problem early, and in regards to the technology, it's one of those you want to hang your hat on. You want to put a check mark next to it and say, hey, we did this. And those saves are worth putting down on paper and presenting at a, something like this. So I, I challenge each of you as, as practitioners, as you come across these really big saves and opportunities, critical or not, you've got to log them. Keep track of them and share them with whatever vendor supplied the technologies involved in finding that problem. And your name and company gets to be put up in something like this. This is a good thing. Justification, 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 right? Always something we have to focus on. Well, I'm going to put a little star up here next where we're kind of going to focus on. And, uh, and what's going on in South Africa that's so important? Well, a small company called Impala Platinum makes this very shiny material. It just happens to be quite expensive lately. In fact, it's always expensive. I think they used to refer to it as the rich man's gold. Right? Now, gold has surpassed it recently. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I think it's got about $100 an ounce on it right now, but still, that's a big deal. Now, Impala Platinum actually is responsible for probably almost a quarter or 25% of the platinum that is worldwide. Okay. Now, and it, and it may be a little bit more, not just specifically this facility, but facilities within that, that corporation. That's a lot. I think we would all agree. And, uh, you know, so... Various methods that they use to go underground. A mile underground is, is, is a long ways. I think we'd all agree with that. And there's a variety of ways that they extract that stuff. And many of you guys have probably been to coal mines and seen the, the depths of that kind of stuff. This long wall mining is interesting because they basically peel away a wall, and then as they peel it away, they, they let it fall behind them. So they're kind of like moving through the earth and letting it fall behind them, which is kind of seems dangerous, doesn't it? Well, sometimes we have to get down there to test the motors that make a difference. OK, 
okay? And this is one of those situations where, you know, whether you use an ultrasonic technology, motor testing, vibrate, whatever, you got to get down in, into this sometimes. And if you get an opportunity, I think you might enjoy it. All for what? For the shiny material. Now, this thing has been coming in around $1,530 an ounce lately. Pretty good. I think that was last week, so it could have changed by now. So, you know, a little piece like this may not go for very much, but still, that adds up pretty quick, right? And in fact, I, my understanding is some of the processing it takes to get this stuff into the refined form, which looks a little bit more like this, is pretty extensive. Now, at $1,530 an ounce, at 99.99% pure, that's about a quarter million dollar bar of platinum. Be nice thing to find laying on the street someplace, wouldn't it? All right. So, you know, platinum's expensive, and, and obviously you can imagine that if, if, if we disrupt that production cycle, it's a big deal. And a variety of things can happen. Civil war is <laughs> always a possibility. Um, you know, flooding, fire, famine, machinery failure, that's what, our, that's what we're here for, right? Reliability is what, why we're here. Okay, and so this is no different. This is a case study on reliability where catching it, saved production, saved equipment. I could say loosely potentially saved lives, but I really don't think that was the case in this situation. And we'll go into a little bit more as to why I feel that way. The case study we're going to be talking about, <clears throat> oh, one more thing. There's also some fun things or some exciting things that go on inside, not just all platinum and work, but there are some things that can occur you know, if you're ever visiting South Africa, not just work-related, but, you know, what do people do on the side? Well, occasionally they go on a hunt, all right, go out and see the wildlife. In this situation, maybe hunting for dinner, but Mr. McGuire next door took the opportunity to actually run around the countryside, and uh, now the gentleman next to him is Wallace, okay? So if you ever get to South Africa, ask for Wallace, and Wallace will make sure that you are not attacked by a lion while you're trying to hunt an impala. So Impala is not just about platinum, but also a lot of livestock around that all those facilities opportunities to go out and, and get involved in some excitement. Um, of course, if you're going to spend the kind of money required to get involved in that excitement, you better find a reason to get it back home. And uh, Mr. McGuire, I have to make sure and mention, is now in the in the in the hunting club book in South Africa. It's not the Boone and Croc, which is over there. It's actually called the. Uh, Oh, David, help me out here. Where are you at? Uh, I'll have to get it. There's a different name for the, the Boone and Croc over in South Africa. But, but he's in the book for a, record, for a record Impala. So just some interesting stuff. A little bit about the wildlife, a little bit about the area, where we're located at. It's uh, certainly, I think I heard during the break, maybe it'd be easier to drill from here to get there than it would be to, to, from there. So it's a long ways away. The clocks are definitely different over there. Let's talk about the problem we're looking at here. We're a long ways underground. Under the water table. Now, now, what's wrong with being under the water table? You can get wet, right? And if, if you're drilling and removing earth and you're, you're living underground and dropping earth behind you as you drill, if the water level comes up, it's not, not a good situation. And we'd all agree with that. Now, so in terms of actually having catastrophic failures in pumps designed to remove the water or to lower the water table so we can actually work and, and breathe, there's a little bit of criticality there. I came from the Navy. Any Navy guys here? Amen. All right. And we used to go under the water by design. All right. Now, it's always good to sink by design, not to sink by accident, right? But isn't it fairly low critical when you're a 1,000 feet underwater becomes a little more critical, doesn't it? This mining environment is very similar to that. In terms of criticality, when things go bump in the night with these type of, of, of applications, we have to do something pretty quick. A little bit of knowledge early helps and goes a long way. And I think this is a situation that we're all trying to accomplish. Find out early and see what's going on. Now, there are other motors to back this specific case study up. So a couple other things would have to go wrong before we started hearing it about it in the news, if you know what I'm saying. But still, considered very critical and big enough to make a difference. So let's dive into this a little bit. It's a uh, 50 hertz core, 6.6 .6 kV, a fairly decent sized motor, considered a medium voltage motor, okay? Uh, not one that we're just going to have a bunch of spares sitting around for no reason, okay? So it is fairly critical and, uh, you know, decent speed on it, not, not too much to offer. Now, one of the things that we do, <clears throat> we call it an inrush startup test. It's basically an RMS envelope of the current signal, okay? It's just something that we, we capture, you know, on, on every motor as a baseline. Okay, much like if you're using any tool, I heard uh, 
I think it was David. David was talking earlier about, you know, initially you don't necessarily have historical data to compare to itself. So what do you do? You compare it to someone like it. Who, did anyone watch Sesame Street as a kid? Okay. Some of us watch it with our kids, or some of us watched it with our moms, right? But either way, it ages us a little bit, right? But um, what was the song? Which one of these is not like the other? That song applies in predictive maintenance all the time. They were comparing what we have to something like it, especially if we don't have any historical data. Now, if you were to take yourself and set into the tech support department of UE or, or PDMA, you're going to constantly see that we're trying to analyze a motor on the very first test. Not because it had to be the very first test, it's because we didn't start testing until what? Something went bump in the night. Okay? The baseline is so critical. If you sit in our tech support department and you're looking at a piece of history and there's only one history, the one that they're complaining about right now, it's just not as efficient of a troubleshooting situation. Get the baseline. Get it, store it. Even if you can't get back for two years, Believe me, that baseline will make a difference in your analysis, in every technology. So in this situation, this is a centrifugal pump. Should centrifugal pumps be oscillating like this? Generally, no. If it was a positive displacement pump, you might expect current oscillations like this. Okay, But in this situation, it wasn't. Well, we don't have any history on this motor. Surprise, surprise. It was the first route done underground, and so we're going to compare it to another spare motor. That has the ability to run the same thing. What, what's different about that? This one's flat. The other one's oscillating. It doesn't take a lot of rocket science to determine that, hey, we've got a difference. Okay? And that difference, a lot of times, is just the, the key to open up what's going on. Now, with a little bit of motor knowledge, if I go back, oscillations at a certain frequency mean a lot. Okay? We want to identify it, look at exactly what that frequency is. No different than what you're doing with your ultrasonics, your vibration, all that. You've got the qualitative indicator, which is this, and then you've got some quantitative indication. Quantitative, instead of zooming in, let's pass that real quick, to an actual spectrum. All right. Now, the spectrum tells us a little bit more, but I'm going to tell you something else. Yes, he's unhappy, and he doesn't like to see the amplitude of this peak as high as it is. It's above the red line, and generally that's not good, right? You don't want to go above the red line. <clears throat> well, this is what we call a pole pass frequency. Now, I'm going to do this on one foot. But if this is the rotating stator magnetic field, does the rotor of an induction motor go faster or slower? Who says faster? Who says slower? Who is afraid it's a trick question? <laughs> All right, that's understandable. It really is. No, no, the stator's magnetic field is invisible and turning around at synchronous speed. The rotor has to be slower, otherwise there's, you know, there's no slip, there's no torque, right? So in this situation, every time the stator magnetic field passes the rotor magnetic field, we get an oscillation. And that oscillation looks something like this and can be seen in a spectrum looking something like this. All right? This right here. Now, let me tell you guys something. I don't know if it's all, and, and, and again, not, you know, it'd be interesting. I, I wanted to do a little more research because I'm sure there's comparative, you know, Type of tests that you're going to do in your vibration, in your, in, certainly in your, in your, in your ultrasonics. Okay. But when it comes to rotor bars, I'm going to tell you that, you know, that PDMA offers six different methods of evaluating those rotor bars. Now, why would we need six? Well, it's because they just happen to be there for one. But if you're not seeing three from just us, we want you to leave that rotor there. Okay. This is probably one of the most potentially missing fault modes that, that we test. It looks like a rotor, it smells like a rotor, but guess what? It's not. It ends up being a, a, ro a rotating element in a pulverizer or something crazy like that, but you want to yank this motor out, send it back to the shop, and then they're going to ask you, hey, what color paint do you want? We don't need to bit re rewind it, or they're just going to rebuild it for you anyway, right? There's a couple choices that they have there, depending on what they're, how honorable they are. But this is a very commonly misdiagnosed area in motor testing today is the rotor cage, the rotor bars themselves. Now, most of you, some of you guys here know, I'm speaking to the choir, you know how difficult it can be to assess the rotors, and certainly correlating with other technologies is, is a must. Comparison to the like motor, well, the, the, the pull pass frequency drops significantly. Now, 
there are other things that need to be done that should have been done. And I wish I had more, more examples from our customer to share with you, but they did one thing. They shut the motor down and did a rotating test. We call it a rotor influence check. All right. Now, this is supposed to be somewhat sinusoidal. And it is somewhat sinusoidal, but it certainly isn't smooth. Okay. That's basically a snapshot image of what the residual flux on the rotor looks like as you slowly turn it from degree to degree. Okay. It's supposed to be smooth. All right. That was sufficient enough to make a decision. Now, when you're, you know, many, many, you know, many, many feet or yards below the earth, just taking a motor out is not a simple task, is it? If it was me on the other end of the phone, I would have had two more examples. I might have said, hey, take another technology down there and, and re-verify this. But one thing I would have very much liked to know is, what is the rotor design? We call this an open rotor bar design. What does open mean? Open means you can see the bars running through the rotor, right? Some bars are closed bar design. And closed bar design, you would not see these bars running through it. It'd be just the iron, just the laminations. Okay, They're inside the rotor. Why does an open bar design scare you a lot more about with rotor defects? Anyone want to offer that detail? Exposed to the environment. Contaminants is one answer. It's a good answer. And it's not, you know, certainly contaminants can get down inside it. That's a concern, but not in terms of the cage continuity. In this situation, we're really concerned about an end ring being broken clear. Okay? The rotor bar separating from the shorting ring. Currents normally flow through these bars into the shorting ring and then back through another pull group based on where the voltage is inducing the power. Okay? So, so it, it's a big problem. But did I hear an answer in the back? In terms of... It is exposed to the environment. It is exposed to the environment, but now I'll tell you what, even in a closed bar design, the in rings are aluminum usually, right? And they're exposed as well. So my concern, but this next picture is going to give it away a little bit. Now, the burning at the end of the laminates. As this bar is running through, it's supposed to be conducting current. If it separates from the end ring, is it conducting current? No, Ohm's law says if resistance is, you know, infinite, there can be no current flowing. But does current try to find a way anyway? Indeed it does, and look where it tries to travel. It is going to try to travel down and short over, jump over those insulated lamination. It will burn the tips of your iron up if you leave it too long. But that's not my biggest concern. Look at this other concern here. See how that's lifted up? Now, if it continues to lift another inch, what does it run into? The stator winding. Right, so now you just turned a $75,000 repair into a $150,000 repair. Now, not to mention, at a quarter million dollars a bar, the possibility of you know, reduction in production. Yeah, reduction in production. I don't have to phrase that. It's a good thing. So millimeters from catastrophic failure, they caught it with two indications and no history, but comparison to another like, like motor, okay? And certainly sufficient enough to make a decision. So this was a big deal, a very big deal. Now, cost savings. This is in a part of the country that uh, works on the RAND, I believe. And so the big thing was not, you know, with minus production, okay? Minus production losses, the repair was the only thing they had to cover. They were able to switch motors, continue to pumping, keep the table down, get this thing removed on some type of rail cart, pushed out and up to the top of, of, of the earth for a rewind, 100,000, savings of 200,000 Rand. Now, I think it's eight to one US to, to, to the Rand. So, so, you know, take the motor that you have similar to that and, and, and establish that. Now, if you can learn nothing from presentation today, please learn that one indication does not mean you got a rotor defect. Three is what we like. Whether it's two PDMA, one UE, two UE, one PDMA, a UE, a PDMA, and a vibration, whatever it takes, make sure you get a couple. And know this, if you don't know the design of your rotor, you're not going to be able to give it the proper severity. If it's an open design, you do not want the bar coming out of the slot, which it will. It'll burn the end of, the, of your laminations up. Bar comes out. At that point, it's getting real, real late in the game. Okay? Maybe a new motor rather than a rebuild. Okay? Now, a little bit about falling back from that specific case study, which was designed to sort of trigger your brain cells and say, hey, 
you know, we're talking, you know, reliability issues here. Let's talk about how you use the technology, whether it's, whether it's ultrasonics, motor testing, infrared, whatever. And a lot of people are, 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 are not utilizing it to, to the full extent that they were designed. And specifically, we like to say reliability first. One of the things we do, you may have heard me talk about it last year, was energy analysis. It was exciting. There's definitely money to be saved in terms of energy, but often a misleading value. And we're going to tell you this, as much money as you can save by, by, by reducing the energy demand, if you, don't ha if you don't do that, if you don't go high efficiency with reliability in mind first, the high efficiency will not pay off. It's got to be a reliable environment to put that high efficiency motor in it. Okay, So reliability first and quality control is the best place to start. How many of you guys install a motor and it's never been tested except for by the vendor, by the motor shop? You know, we don't want to raise our hands here, right? Now, it's one thing if you have some type of contractual agreement with your vendor that's doing the testing that you, you baseline, and that's probably the case with General Mills. You guys are good customer bars as well. Um, now, that being said, I'm sure there's situations where it happens, and I always tell people, if the motor is going to be installed without a quality control test, let the new guy start the motor. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's a memorable phrase. Let the new guy start the motor. You want him to push the button when the fire comes out. We all know smoke turns the rotor. When the smoke comes out, the motor does not work anymore. You got It's hard to catch that smoke and get it back in. Right? So, so quality control. If your warehouse isn't full of stuff that you know the quality of, you're missing step one. And it's such a huge element. I would say if you're going to start nowhere, start there. Okay. That's the place to start, quality control, in the warehouse, in the back of the truck, whatever. Then we go into the less exciting, the trending part of the technology, recording the ultrasonics, recording the current, recording the voltage. Record. Man, it's not the most exciting, is it? It's kind of like the old Dunkin' Donuts. It's time to make the donuts, right? Somewhat boring, maybe. But you set in a predictive, or you set in a technology support division, and this is where that history becomes so important. You're trying to make a call that's going to save your company 200,000 Rand or $100,000. And if all you have is one historical test, who's confident in making that call? Sure, you could call Doug and he'd probably help you through that analysis, right? You could call me and I'd send you to somebody else to help you with the analysis. But you can get that done, but you got to make the call. And if not, let the new guy make the call, right? I mean, I always throw him under the bus. But the point is, is you've got to get that history. I can't say enough. Trend is your friend. Right, this poor guy's out there working his tail off getting year-to-year -year data that makes all the difference when you've got to make the call. <clears throat> Finally, end of life happens to us all, whether we're people or motors, be ready for that. Have a procedure in place, right? Have that knowledge that when end of life comes, it could be quick. Increase the test frequency, and I'm talking, I'm, I know I'm speaking to the choir. I know that you guys hear this a lot, okay, but troubleshooting is a big deal. I can't stress enough that if your reliability technologies are geared up with some type of procedural compliance when trouble begins, when that motor trips, what do you do? What do you look at? What's your process? Is there a flow chart that you go, you actually attack on a, on a failure? Or is it just, well, let's see who's in, who, what do we do? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sit and think about this very well, right? So, so it, you know, it, it's something that I, I really stress having a procedure. That's one thing that the, the Navy does right. I always thought that the, the casualty procedures was a big deal, right? When something goes bump in the night, is there a flow chart to follow? When you're not sure what's going on, what technology do you apply? How can you get through that? Because a lot of times when it comes to troubleshooting, it's exciting to find the problem. But for those who are paying for it, it was much more exciting if it never happened. And the quicker you get back up and running, that's what excites them. It's a time to, re to back to, to production. That's a big deal. So, in general, those three areas, if you're missing one of them, you're missing a large percent of your value and you're not getting a return on investment. When it comes to electrical, and this crosses over to, you know, there's, there's, there's mechanical elements here and electrical elements here. Know that there are more than one thing that kills your motor, power quality, right? You're listening for you know, arcing and sparking with the big dish. You're looking for harmonic distortion with your, with your, with your PDMA test equipment, a variety of things. You are what you eat, right? We've heard that from your mother. You are what you eat. The motor is what you feed it, okay? If the heating is a problem, look at the power quality first, okay? Especially if you trust your vendor. If the motor's good, quality manufactured up front, you verified that because we've got a good QA program. Go for your quality control. Make sure your power quality, sorry, is where you focus. 
Next is power circuit. Good quality power has to go through something, right? And things go wrong. Sometimes you got a brand spanking new high efficiency motor in 40 year old cables connecting it to the power supply, right? <clears throat> Sometimes we have to think about that. Cables don't stick around forever. And if you're, especially if you're, if, if your company has a standard policy of high potential testing your cables, not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent. If you're doing that, be aware that you are, there's a good chance you may be reducing the overall life. Be aware of that. Keep an eye on that. Make sure it doesn't bump, come up and surprise you in the middle of the night. <clears throat> stator windings. Man, if I could tell you anything about stator windings, and there's a neat thermography picture that comes up here, that's a QA check. That's somebody catching it in the motor shop. Guess what you don't have access to? That. You can't open up a motor and look at that stator winding with a thermal camera. Okay? If you can take the end bells off, maybe. I do think someday there's going to be viewports that are actually going into a motor. You know, and actually get in there with some type of movable thermal camera. I just think it's going to happen. Right? Uh, and until that happens, we have to check it at the starter and try to figure out what's going on. If this is happening, it's too late. Okay? The stator faults should not happen. If you have good quality control up front, you're trending it, you know when the end of life is coming, you're prepared for that. Okay? And that doesn't mean that catastrophic events don't happen. You start a motor and the torque causes too much movement and they didn't strap the interns down well enough and, and it cracks off some insulation, guess what? And there's no warning sometimes with that. All right? And that's unfortunate. But identify the conditions that are conducive to your stator fault. Get them out of the way. You should be expecting 15 to 20 years of life on your stator windings. If you're not getting that, check your quality control first and then make sure you're on top of that trend. Remove the things that cause this to happen so it's not happening. We don't want a trend to turn to turn fault. Okay? That's not what you want to do. Insulation to ground is very different. You can have smoke coming out of the side of the motor. Take your handy dandy megometer. Some of us remember these. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Remember that? The hand crank megometer. Yes, we've been around a while, haven't we? Well, and what it, what could it read possibly? It could read a short or it could read infinite. Now, how can smoke be rolling out of the side of the motor but the insulation to ground test be infinite? Usually people go like this. Knock on the meter, try it again, right? I mean, that's standard protocol. I do the same thing. Go get another one. It's got to be wrong. It happens all the time. All the time. If you have not put your motor in a reliable condition, you can have an absolute turn-to-turn -turn failure, smoke coming out of the motor, but the ground wall is untouched. The failure occurred at an intern that's not touching any metal. Happens all the time. Be prepared for that. You can't rely just on the ground wall testing. There has to be other tools involved phase-to-phase -phase resistance, inductance, the things that are out there and available. Air gap, a lot of people don't put a lot of time into that. I know certainly in the vibration industry, there, there's ways to track that, twice line, open the high-end frequency range. We're going to look at it with current. That air gap is small these days, ain't it? used to be I feel like I could stick my hand between the air gap of the rotor and the stator. Well, now I can't hardly see air between that, right? Light doesn't hardly travel through that anymore. Those high-efficiency motors are incredible. And, and as a result, it becomes a little bit more sensitive. Rotor is touching the stator, not good, right? We've got to get that under control. Can I tell you one thing? Precision, balance, and alignment is money well spent. I would write that down. If it's not in your quality control standards, if it's not in your motor repair specification, precision, balance, and alignment costs you more and pays for itself every time. However, only if the mechanic is not too heavy-handed when he's bolting that motor down, right? Motors today can be so easily warped and twisted because the frame is not nearly as massive, okay? A uh, 40-horsepower motor a couple hundred years ago would crush this table. Today, some of you big guys could probably carry a 40-horsepower motor around. Am I right? Maybe. Young guys. <clears throat> All right, so finally the rotor, the rotating element. We can't dismiss it. It's actually the most fun one because it's moving. Everything else is just sitting there looking at you. It's magnetic. It's invisible, but the rotor actually turns... And that was our case study today. The one tangible element, guess what? Blame for 10% of the motor problems today. 10% of the motor failures are blamed on the rotor. But if I combine the ground wall insulation and the stator windings, now I'm looking at 46%. Okay? I'm sorry, 36% of the motor's problems. If you combine 36% stator and insulation, 10% rotor, you're dealing with 50% of the problems that cause motor failures let me make sure this was in a utility industry study, okay, in it being somehow electrically related. Be on top of that. Make sure you're utilizing the technologies. Now, finally, 
when should your first ultrasonics or PDMA motor testing or infrared testing, or when should the technology first be utilized or be discussed on, an, on, on your assets? Startup is a, is, a, is a good answer. I'm going to push you guys, challenge you guys to go earlier at the design level. If your maintenance reliability staff are not part of a new project design, then, then you're missing an opportunity. Is it a whole lot? I know there's some infrared guys here. There's, there's ultrasonics. Everybody's here that, that a lot of people that provide technology. Is it easier to get new technology in budgeted at a project level where there might be a $10 million budget? Or after it's all installed and you're asking for a couple hundred thousand dollars in technology? When is it easier? The price doesn't change. Answer? No question about it. Now, what? <coughs> well, the answer is it's cheaper up front. And tell, can you tell us why? Because the price doesn't necessarily. We don't sell it any cheaper. I mean, am I? I mean, you know, not necessarily. You, you take any project um, to, to do a retrofit, and you've got an awful lot of money <coughs> meeting project management, just time to get things through, everything else. So gotcha. To do the same amount of work as part of the project up front from the ground up, you're guaranteed to save. 30, Good point. The point was being made is that the, the meetings required, the authorizations required, instead of doing it twice, you only have to do it once, right? And getting, I'm, I'm telling you, getting a $10,000 uh, probe, getting a $25,000 tester, do, getting that in into a $10 million project is so much easier, so much easier to get passed through. In a locomotive industry, you know how much of those locomotives cost? <laughs> They're expensive. Right. And for us to get a little, you know, twenty two thousand dollar, you know, tester involved in that is easy. Twenty two thousand versus millions is so small. OK, but man, you start asking for that after the fact. Oh, well, money spent, you know, good luck. I'm challenging you guys to go to the design level of any project. Make sure that maintenance and reliability is part of that. Get it in the fold early. Now, for the infrared industry and possibly for other technologies, when it, and for motor testing, certainly, test access panels, windows, all those things that go in, boy, I guess when they're so much easier, when they're at a shop under a UL listed shop. What does that mean? That means that they can put those stuff in under their name and everything comes to you UL listed, all are done. You don't have to have any arguments over how it affects UL, even though we know that the, the right answer there and stuff, I don't know where the iris guys are. It should be an independent conversation. But for you to maintain UL, you really have to have a certified engineer come out and do that, right? That's an argument that take we can take that to another conversation. Point being is, boy, it's so much easier at design, right? And let's get involved there. <clears throat> buying a motor. When you're buying a motor, when you're refurbishing a motor, can I tell you that if you don't live in your motor shop every once in a while, you're doing a disservice to your company? Do you know the name of the plant manager at the motor repair shop? If not, somebody in your department should. Visit those guys. They, they, they might not give you a smile every time you show up at their facility, but let me tell you this. They so much like better when they know what you want and they don't have to read your mind or they don't have to argue after they've already returned something to you and you're saying, wait, wait, wait why didn't you do that? Because it's not in your spec, right? Have that done early. Build it into the buying process. Storage, okay? This is an old-looking picture, but I was walking through an aluminum industry. Any aluminum facilities here? Okay. I was walking through the plant, and I asked, why are you keeping all those junk motors? And they said, well, those are our spare motors. I said, well, we need to talk about that, right? If the spare motor storage looks like a junk motor pile, then something is wrong. Storage is critical, right? The motors have to be babied through that process. And if you're putting it next to a major, you know, application that's shaking the floor, guess who's going to be very busy? Your ultrasonics guys are going to be hearing things way early in life. I mean, right from the get-go, you're going to have Brunelling. It's going to happen. Storage is important. Build reliability into it. Now, startup. Now back, well, David, you mentioned startup. <clears throat> I consider it one of the most critical elements. Be there on the initial start. Capture that. Make sure that you're not putting a motor in a bad environment, okay, or putting a bad motor in a good environment. Either way, it's not a happy, it's not a happy marriage, is it? No, you've got to be there. These young gentlemen here are there at the start. First push button, we're capturing it. We're making sure power quality is good, power circuit's good, and the motor's healthy. Everything that starts healthy lasts longer, right? If it starts bad, it, it, it goes bad quickly. <coughs> Operations. Make sure you know who's operating your equipment and ask them questions every once in a while. Can't tell you how many times operators are the ones answering the reliability issues, right? 
I used this analogy last year. I got to use it again. My wife is the operator of our family truckster. Okay. And she's got rugrats running around all the time. And it used to be she'd say, Hey, there's something wrong with the van. I'd just make some weird noise. I'd get in it, drive around the block. Did I hear anything? No. I said, You're crazy. There's nothing wrong with this van. And who was picking it up on the side of the road a week later? Me with the red face, right? She's the operator. She knows how it works, feels everything about it, how the meters move. People who start your motors know how the meter's supposed to move. You'd be surprised how many guys, if you just go talk to them, say, hey, it takes a little longer to start that motor. Guess what happened to the same pump that we just experienced a case study on mile underground in? Took longer to start up. Didn't have it on, a, on an example, unfortunately, but I can guarantee it took longer to start up because that's the way motors work. Broken bars, less torque, longer startup time. It's very simple. Operators know a lot more than you might think. <clears throat> and then finally, the easy part, this is our life, maintaining. Do the trending. Trend is your friend. Get the data down. Work very closely with your vendors. Make sure their support knows how to access your data. Okay, Use them as, as an assistance. That's a big, big part of the success. Uh, that's part of the reason that UE, PDMA, we, we always feel good and comfortable in this environment because quality is the issue. This is big. And don't, don't downplay that. That's all part of the initial purchase and, and take advantage of that. So that is it. Did I do it in time? I got time for questions even. Any questions about lion hunt like that, talk to David McGuire next door. Okay. But other than that, I can answer most questions. Uh, using PDMA with uh, variable frequency drives, will that, hey, hey, can you figure out if you're having current shaft current voltage and can you tell if the VFD is operating properly? Okay, uh, two very answering the first one. Um, the and this is less from empirical studies done by PDMA and more just from reports from the field. Okay, when it comes to shaft line currents, we don't claim to be your first identifier. Okay, now if we spend a little bit more time researching that and working with some other technologies, maybe um, shaft excuse me, shaft monitoring devices and things like that, we're, we're going to kind of steer you towards for your critical applications. From the field, high frequency harmonics to the tune of the, you know, up around the 50th, you know, 30th to 50th uh, hertz or 30th to 50th harmonic of line frequency are indications of shaft line currents from the field. We have no literature that we're sharing to support that. But anyone who's using the technology... Start looking up around 30 to 40 hertz, or 30 to 40 multipliers of, of the line frequency for what I consider broadband energy, okay, broadband harmonics. The second question was uh, whether or not we can identify the quality of the drive. If I were to take you back to the early days, and I'm aging myself here, back in the 90s and late 80s or whatever, into our customer support department, the most common conversation as our technology hit the road or hit the street was, is it the motor or is it the pump? Now, we all get involved in those conversations still today, I know. But technology is so far advanced. you got stuff that early identifiers of, of, of bearings and shafts and couplings and all that, motor health and reliability. It's a pretty quick analysis usually, is it the motor or the pump? The common conversation at PDMA right now is, is it the motor or is it the drive? And I would say that dominates the day in technical support. Okay. Now, a couple things we have to do sometimes. Generally, it's easy. You do a line side of the drive test. You do a load side of the drive test. You want to check both sides. You got to know if there's filters or reactors. That makes a big difference. Sometimes it's just a reactor failing in one phase, right? The output of a drive has a very expected appearance. Zero turnoffs of the transistors or the SCRs is, is how they should be. It should be flat line into the next phase rotation, right? So there is absolute indications of failure, and for the most part, of drive today, pulse width modulated drives are delivering less than 1% voltage imbalance and as much as less than 1% current imbalance. All that goes south when a, when a card starts to be affected. If it's misfiring, that's going to be easy to pick up. On the line side, you can tell whether the drive is actually affecting the line side as well. Not always do you have EC access downstream of the drive. If you don't, Go to the line side. If you have a failed inverter, if you have a failed SCR or transistor, guess what gets transmitted to your distribution system? Harmonics of that level. Your voltage harmonics start increasing. So absolutely, yes, VFDs are part, are, are part of our everyday analysis. But when it comes to that shaft line currents, I would consider that still a thing to be researched. Good question. Thank you. Yes, my question is, what horsepower is this necessary? 
The question is, at what horsepower is this necessary? And of course, the answer is going to be, that depends, right? Now, I, like I can go to a, like a steel mill, and literally I've heard people talk about anything from 250 horse down, pow. And yet I've been to other facilities where the biggest motor they have is 50 horse. Now, so naturally I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move you towards a criticality conversation before I can horsepower, right? So uh, a, a five horsepower motor can cost a company a million dollars in one facility. If that thing goes down, it takes two days to get the process back up and running. Now, there's some companies here today that are, and you guys are probably already set here, but if you don't have criticality established across the boards for your assets, you've missed a very important step. Talk to some folks here today. There are some people here that are designed to, if you don't feel comfortable in assessing the criticality, uh, they'll walk in and almost hand you an algorithm to help you do that. And so I would say it's based on the criticality. Uh, and a lot of times this includes cost, impact to the environment, impact to safety. Um, what am I missing? Loss of production. Thank you. You know, in, and even in our technology, criticality is a four alphanumeric indicator, right? So you, it's up to you how you want to control that, but it could be alpha or numeric, but that's got to be first. Now, I'll tell you that across the boards in general, I see people, the, the cost to repair versus replace does become a conversation. And for the most part, I think that number is all over three figures right now. So from 75 to 100 horsepower, depending on what part of the country you're in, repair and replace are awful close in cost. And that changes from manufacturer to manufacturer. Other questions? No? Great. Thank you, Noah. Thank you guys.